So you all probably noticed when you came in uh, that this is being video recorded, uh, virtually recorded, I guess, and video recorded. The um, recordings live at um, Northampton Open Media. Um, so anyone can go to those uh, recordings and um, view them later in actual time or speed it up time if you wanted. Um, this is the Northampton Energy and Sustainability Commission meeting, October of October 18th. We shifted the dates because of the holiday last week, I just tripped up. So we should be on a sort of back to the regular, what Tuesday would that be? The second Tuesday, Chris, yep. um, of the month um, for November. Um, and we have um, some items on the agenda, I guess first up, is the um, public comment. So if anybody wants to make a public comment, um, we can go ahead with those. And I see Adele Franks has her hand up first. Thank you. So um, <clears throat> some of you may be aware that the Department of Energy Resources has released its net zero stretch code, uh, which has been long um, in the process. And uh, despite all of the comments that many of us submitted saying that a net zero opt-in stretch code um, should not allow fossil fuel combustion on site, they have included a fossil fuel combustion pathway. So um, it's very interesting. And um, the uh, <clears throat> uh, TUE, uh, the Telecommunications um, an energy commission has unprecedentedly uh, decided, well, I am told anyway, through the grapevine, that they are going to have a hearing about this. This is never the case uh, at this point in the process. So stay tuned. Can everybody turn, uh, can everybody mute their microphone if they're not speaking? Okay, so I don't see anybody else with their hands raised. Um, so we'll go on to um, the next item, which is the approval of the minutes from September 13th. Move to approve. Okay, Okay, there's a motion and a second. And any discussion before I do a roll call? Okay. So, um, Rachel Mayori, how do you vote? Yes. Okay. Yes. Thanks. Um, and Gordon. Excellent. Yes. Uh, ben. Yes. Louis. Yes. Chris. Yes. And did I get everybody? Everybody but you. I guess I'll say yes. <laughs> Thanks. Um, OK, Chris. Um, were you going to describe the next item? Do you want to go for that? Uh, yes. So as we're putting together the, the annual green communities um, annual report, I figured I, I realized that one of our PV arrays has not been reporting data online. It is still producing. It is still producing net meterings. But what happened was that the uh, the modem was 3G and the rest of the world went to 4G. Um, so we need to update a modem. So I uh, would accept a motion, or actually, I guess if I'm acting in Pat's stead, I could move to approve the expenditure of up to $3,500 from the Energy and Sustainability Revolving Fund to upgrade the data reporting modem for the PV array at Florence Fields. 
Move to approve. Do we have a second? Uh, actually, can I ask a question before we do that? Can you tell us what our balance is in that account? Oh, I don't know it offhand, but it, there's plenty. Um, it's over 100,000. Okay, because the uh, effort that the, um, the mowing commission is undertaking uh, will require some seeds to be purchased, some wildflower seeds. And I think that we would like to recommend to the greater committee that, that some funds come out of there. And it, uh, so I think that we want to make sure that we're keeping track of that fund. And I think that probably a lot of us would like to see that fund being used for projects that you know the ideas are generated by this commission uh, instead of being continuously dipped into by the city, which it has been for the last four years that I've been on this commission. Um, and so I would, I would like to advocate for that fund really being reserved for projects that we come up with here, uh, as opposed to just being dipped into whenever money is needed. So that, that's my two cents on that. But I, I would certainly second the move to approve uh, using those funds for that purpose. Any, any further comments or questions? Carolyn, you wanna do the roll call or? Sure. Um, Rachel? Yes. Gordon? Yes. Ben? Yes. Louis? Yes. Uh, Chris? Yes. And I vote yes. Okay. Um, I guess the next item on the agenda is follow up on pre the previous meeting and status reports. Um, Chris, do you have, um, you want to run through these? Sure. Just because the commission did approve funds being spent, I'll come back and report back. The Smith Volk PV repair cost $369. Turned out to be some kind of power spike hit a fuse. And that was all it was. So they had to replace the fuse. Um, that's very nice. Uh, we also spent $4,200 on the construction cost estimate for the Leeds ERV and VRF system. I'll go a little bit farther than reporting back on that, just to let you know that the, um, the cost estimate came in quite high. Um, a few of us pushed back on it, asked some questions. Uh, they reevaluated and the price came in lower, but it's still high, higher than expected, higher than our engineers expected, higher than I expected, um, higher than, I think Ben, you would agree, but higher than you expected. Um, so uh, just real quickly, the cost of the, of the energy recovery ventilation and VRF heat pump system came in at 1.8 million. That's not, that's not counting overhead and other stuff like that. Our next step is to um, go back and see if we can value engineer this. Looking at it, it's like, okay, we have a really nice system designed here. Etc. So we're going to push back and see if we can get the price down a bit. Um, but it may be what we're looking at when we're talking about energy recovery ventilation and heat pump systems. And I will remind everybody that if that is the case, we are getting not only green out of it, we are getting filtered air. And um, uh, uh, what was the other one I was going to say? Oh, fil filtered air and energy recovery ventilation is saving energy. Um, so. Oh, oh, yes, and of course, the, the ability to do cooling. Um, so you are providing two primary services along with what you're doing here. But um, ongoing, um, we're going to try to get that price down before we try to move forward with it. Let's see, other ones. Um, so a few more follow-ups. And I'm going to actually welcome anybody else if they have follow-ups from the last meeting to weigh in here, too. But uh, so uh, charging money for EV charging station. Uh, someone had mentioned, I think it was at the last meeting, that we should see what our neighbor's doing. And um, I was pretty su surprised. Um, 18, uh, only 18 out of 70 uh, charging stations in the Pioneer Valley that um, uh, one of my coworkers went out and looked at, 
um, I went online from ChargePoint and said, you know, what are they charging? Only 18 out of 70 are actually free. And we've got a good chunk of those. Um, medium uh, cost is about $1.65 per hour. Um, average cost is about $2.50 per hour. Um, so from that, I think it'd be kind of a no-brainer. We just have to kind of go through the paperwork and the planning and the approvals needed to uh, switch, switch over to a payment system. Um, I think it's just kind of let you know that that's where the city will be going. Um, any questions on that? And then the last thing on I wanted I had down here on the agenda for follow-up is the EV drive event. And I'm actually hoping someone else, if anybody else was at the event, if we could get just a little bit of a, a feedback on, on how it went. Adele Louis? has her hand up. Ah, okay. Oh, Louis. Go ahead, Louis. Wait, do that. Adele can go first. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I was there and my husband brought along a, um, electric mower and weed whacker and that sort of thing. But um, um, the weather was not good and not very many people came, but those who came were very happy uh, to learn about uh, EVs. And um, uh, that's my report. I think that the next time um, there should be um, a, a lot more effort for advertising. Louis, do you want to add anything? Well, again, like Adele said, the weather wasn't um, conducive for a big party type atmosphere. It was cold, it was rainy. Um, more people showed up than I actually expected because of how the weather was. We got a little bit of signage taped up around, but that might be um, getting signage up on Main Street to direct people down behind would have helped and a lot of people got rides in in uh, electric cars in fact got to drive them i take my hat off to the people who's who brought their own cars and let just strangers drive them up and down 91. Um, the test drive route was was uh pretty nice um, they got you south onto 91 north back and then down through town to get back to city hall so it was a it was a test drive for sure um the um the the, the electric bmw was the hot ticket um <laughs> but but um a couple of dealers had some some of the more uh practical or pragmatic small small electric cars there was a uh a Rivian electric pickup truck, which turned out to get recalled about an hour after the after the the drive thing. But I, it's it the people that did get there, I think, got a pretty good lesson in uh, uh, how electric cars work out. Um, uh, again, I wish that there'd been more people and maybe a little more technical information. But, um, did well with the best we could do it. And I don't know if it, everybody got the email from <clears throat> the organizer, but um, he talked about ways that we could have it better next year also. It's like Louis frozen. You want to go, Ben? <laughs> Yeah, so I, I didn't attend the event um, and didn't let anyone drive my car, but um, I on the subject of the charger charging facilities that the city runs, I think if we could develop a plan to phase out the level two chargers and replace them with DC fast chargers, which I realize is it requires different electrical uh, hookups, I mean, it, it, it's not without expense. But essentially, a level two charger is pretty close to useless for today's EV driver. Um, it was great back when the Nissan Leaf was the standard uh, because you actually could fill up in a reasonable amount of time and get the range that you were expecting from the, that, your car. But if you want to go from, say, 20% to 80%, 
and you've got a modern EV. So, you know, like, uh, you know, a Mach-E, a Ford Mach-E or my Hyundai Kona or um, anything like uh, that 300 mile range vehicle, which is where, where they mostly are these days, uh, you just don't get the capacity. And if you don't, and, and because you've got so much battery, you don't go any place where it's going to make a difference for you to charge on a level two charger for two hours. But a fast charger makes the city a destination. So if you're up going to 91 and you're heading somewhere up, up north in Vermont or you're coming down from Vermont towards New York, you now have a reason to spend an hour in downtown Northampton buying delicious food in our in our downtown. And it's you it, there's nowhere else like that. It, it's really valuable to you. So that's what I would say is, is a good reason to try and change. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, Ben, I'll, I'll just um, do a slight, I, I, I'm gonna agree with you a level three charger or some level three chargers, I think would be a boon for the uh, for Northampton. They cost about $30,000. That was before prices went up. Um, uh, so um, we're really liking, we're, we're, we, we really like the idea of a, um, of a private owner coming in and investing in level three chargers instead of the city. Um, and I do believe, uh, I do believe I'm right to say that if you charge in a level three charger all the time, you will wear your battery out faster. Absolutely true. Yeah. Okay. So, but what I'm saying is, nobody with with a 300 mile range car bothers with the level two charger in downtown, or at least very rarely. It's mostly mostly those plug in hybrids, which which are valid too. I'm not saying get rid of okay. all of them, but if you want to attract EVs, and again, there's there's the um, uh, the IRA, the um, uh, Inflation Reduction Act, has a lot of money for fast charging. Yep. So. No, I agree with you. With fast chargers, are needed somewhere in town. Yep. Okay. That's it. Um, one more, one more big, quick question. <clears throat> Who would we uh, who would we talk to about trying to get some kind of a ballpark estimate on how much we're looking at per unit per installation per charger station? Um, is that something that we can easily, without too much trouble, figure out? Anybody know anybody? I mean, you could contact EVGo, which is popular here. I, I hesitate to talk about electrify america because half of the time their chargers aren't working but <laughs> but evgo seems to be fairly dependable it's the same model as charge point um so the same kind of uh, contract that you that you have with charge point you, you um, cut out there a little bit you cut out there a little bit louis i think you were asking how how can you find out the uh, the cost of the level three charger yeah so just for equipment, we could look at state contracts and see what they're they're running for there. Um, Chris, who was that salesperson that was contacting you, then me, then you, who wanted to put, um, I think he wanted solar in the parking lot, but he was going to combine it with a charging station. Is that right? Am I remembering that correctly? I've, I've been receiving different inquiries about um, putting in a big battery bank and then perhaps having PV with it, perhaps having an EV charger with it. Okay. Um, and uh, up until now, I, although I think I've gotten one, one person who's gonna come back with a solid proposal, they tend to come in and say, city, don't you want this? I said, hey, that's nice. Yeah, where do you wanna do it? I don't know, where should we do it? I said, no, it's not up to me. You know, I, it's not up to me to find out who, you know, where National Grid's um, uh, service can hold it. But it's, it's like, do your homework <laughs> and come to us with a proposal. So uh, we may have one of them with a proposal coming in. Um, yeah. Okay. Um... Next item, um, 
is feedback requested, um, input on construction projects, regulations or policy changes, um, adding sustainability metrics into the CIP process. And I think um, Chris sent out the forms that the um, finance department had, um, it will be using for city departments. Is that, that was in the attachment, right Chris? It was. Yeah. So, um, um, yeah, Carolyn or Louie, anybody else? Uh, I mean, are there are the other projects, initiatives, regulations, or policy changes that I don't know about. Go ahead and bring them up here. But since we've been speaking about the capital improvement process, um, there was a change to how we're doing it this year. And I could share my screen and just kind of go through it real quick with people if they haven't gone through it themselves. Uh, and if anybody wants to give us feedback on it. I mean, this is what we're doing this year, but it can't hurt to have feedback. Anybody else with anything else besides this? I, I'll just say that I don't have any, I don't have any construction projects that, that um, you know, are in the pipeline except for, um, you know, big, pro like Valley CDC is coming forward for their big um, renovation of um, the Bridge Road pro uh, property, but I don't see that as an input point for the commission. Um, they've already, they have um, uh, designed their project to be, um, you know, complete overhaul of that building anyway with a um, rooftop coverage with solar. And um, I think they're going to be all electric as well. So, um, and no, regulatory changes that um, come to mind either. That project might need a little bit of support um, for um, uh, service uh, hot water because one of the dropbacks is gas for hot water because, because of a limited amount of energy available. But and I don't know if we could get involved in um, making suggestions early enough in the process. I mean, there are ways out. They're not 50% there by any stretch. So if anybody's, you know, and do we want to somehow set up um, beyond the zoning uh, contact? Is it worth uh, bringing them in for a, for a discussion with the Energy Commission? Maybe not everybody, but some of the people. You mean so, to address the water, the hot water? Um, to address fossil, fossil fuel um, augmented heating of some sort. And you want the sauce. And um, I, I guess I'm just responding that yes, if, if there's a way to get in there before they make it, before they get themselves over com committed to one path or another. I would definitely like to to help with that. There are so many opportunities with hot water that are mostly getting bypassed. Um, so yeah, I, I, I'd love us to be able to, especially, especially just to establish that some of these paths are really good ones. So yeah. I mean, it seems to me, Louie, I know you've been working with them um, a little bit, I think, um, but it seems to me there, um, you know, now would be the time before, because they've already done a significant amount of design, certainly for the exterior, for the site, um, for the rooftop system, um, and the layout of the units in, you know, the um, apartment units within the building, um, and they, but they haven't finalized the they may have sort of finalized their finance packet, but they certainly haven't obtained their financing from the state um, in terms of their tax credits and all the other funding sources that they're going to be seeking for their project. But I think they're pretty, my guess is they're pretty close um, to that, but it may still allow for um, adjustments. Um, and, you know, 
I certainly could. If there are people, I mean, if it sounds like the co some committee, some subcommittee members would want to um, discuss with them, or maybe just individuals, um, an individual person from this group might be more appropriate than a um, subset because then it, you know we'd have to set up. Um, We'd have to calendar it and it'd be a public meeting if you if there's an official subcommittee. Um, and just in terms of the timing, you, you know, it may be that someone could just reach out to um, the project manager at Valley and just initiate that conversation. Um, so I don't know what you got, what your preferences would be. Well, I can certainly do that. There's a Zoom meeting every Wednesday morning. Um, um, that doesn't always get into all the nuts and bolts, but I'll, I'll be on tomorrow morning and I'll talk to him about it. How many people can we have without it being a public meeting? Can two of people from the um, commission show up in front of this or is it only the one? Well, if it's an ad, I mean, if it's an ad hoc one off thing, then it wouldn't be a committee. But once you create sort of a subcommittee to work with um, project proponents, then it's whenever you have a quorum of the subcommittee. Um, so if you're just doing an ad hoc review that's one off, then, you know, as long as it's not a quorum of the whole um, group, then you'd be OK. So I'll see what happens. I'll see what they think tomorrow. Okay. Louie, if they are open to having people, I'd love to be just a fly on the wall um, when others give feedback. It's a good learning experience. Um, you know, the alternative is, um, Chris, we could, I mean, I can talk to you in more detail offline, but we do for larger projects, there is a technical review process. It's an internal review um, to give feedback to the applicants about building code issues. And so if it makes sense to bring you into those um, reviews at the front end of projects, um, to identify um, issues that the applicants might want to consider um, as part of their design, then um, maybe that's a way to get ahead of, uh, you know, at the front end of these projects. Yeah, let's talk about that outside of okay. this. Yeah, I mean, okay. that could be something, a structure that we could try to bring in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. We have two hands up. Uh, was it Eric? I think you had your hand up first. Oh, I thought it was Adele. Um, I'm going to put something in the chat if, if I can. Oh, no, I can't. Um, sorry, we have a solar assisted heat pump water heater. Um, I don't know if it would scale to the needs of that building that was just being mentioned. But um, I could forward the link to Chris um, just to have somebody check it out. That's all. Thanks. Thanks, Eric. Adele? As uh, local energy advocates, uh, we spoke with um, Lori on site uh, about the potential for geothermal at that site. Um, and I never heard another word back, but I'm wondering whether anyone else has and whether they've strongly considered it and perhaps ruled it out, but they have quite a bit of land around that building. So it seemed to us like it might uh, very well lend itself to geothermal power. So if, if, if you can get any feedback on that tomorrow, that would be very helpful. I know there was discussion already in the and there was a little bit of uh, investigation into cost and the cost for geothermal was um, pretty high um, on a you know, dollar per BTU basis. Um, 
it's also a little ways out, and I think we're going to get a, a little bit better idea of what happens at Smith on a couple of those test wells, and we may get some nuts and bolts, dollars and cents information from them also. And I don't know who did the uh, geothermal mm -hmm. for the um, senior center, but um, and how cost benefit is working out on that also that's uh, and I don't know who to ask about it. I don't know if we have um, I mean start with Pat, but who's paying attention to it? Yeah, I would just uh, kind of second what Louis saying geothermal was a really brilliant thing probably 20 years ago, but when you do, uh, cost analysis, um, the air source heat pumps that we have now are so efficient and it saves all of the cost of drilling wells uh, that when you, your, your payback is actually much better switching to an air source heat pump. Uh, ben may correct me here. Yeah, so I, I don't want this to turn into a <laughs> dialogue, but, um, but I would say that this is a question of scale. You, you hit a scale where shared resources allow, essentially, to get really technical, the condenser water, the more you can share it, the more you can share heat, the more efficient um, a water source heat pump is, and the geothermal exchanger can be a big part of that. Probably enough said for this context. <laughs> okay. So with that, I'm gonna go over the, um, actually anything else? on uh, early notice projects. Carolyn, you didn't think you had anything there, but you did. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I'm just gonna share a screen. So can everybody see the, um, I wish I could always see the screen that I'm looking at. I can never tell what you're looking at. So just real quickly, what the city is asking for right now is, um, I'm just gonna go through the questions one at a time. Does this investment expand services or maintain current levels of services? And um, we're doing this through pull down lists. Oh, can't read that. But it basically is it expands services, increases or adds a new capacity or function. Just if we're, if we're doing that, we wanna know about that um, because if we're going to be adding greenhouse gas emissions, it'd be nice to do it for a reason. The city's job is to provide services much. So just trying to ask that. Does the investment help reduce greenhouse gas emissions? In other words, does it reduce energy use? Uh, and that's fairly simple. Again, it's pull down list, easy to get the right mouse. In other words, investment maintains services while reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Investment maintains services that has no effect on greenhouse gas emissions, et cetera. So we're trying to make it a pretty easy pull down for, for folks. And um, they can contact me if they have questions. So if they're not sure whether or not this has an effect on greenhouse gas emissions, most things that people are going to be trying for probably won't. Because um, so a great amount of the capital improvement projects really don't have to do with energy. So then were options considered that would maximize reduction of greenhouse gas emissions or prepare for future greenhouse gas emission reduction projects? This is kind of, this one's um, it's an open-ended question. Um, and we'll see how, we'll see what we get. We're basically trying to find out whether or not they really looked at the project to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And we're not looking for someone to just put in the the highest efficiency gas boiler or the most efficient, whatever, you know, whatever, they're just trying to do the most efficient thing. We're, we're asking them, did you take an opportunity to look for now or in the future planning for greenhouse gas emissions? It's probably gonna be one of the harder questions for some of the uh, department heads to, to answer. Okay, identify supporting documentation or reason to expect greenhouse gas emission reductions. In our list, Again, that's a pull down list. Either follow the city or a mayoral policy aimed at reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So if you're doing something like buying an EV bus or buying an EV vehicle because it's a mayoral policy, then you get to count that. 
um, a professional study aimed in part at reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So if you did take a look at a deep dive and just, you can kind of point to a, a study, great, tell us about it. Uh, action is specified in the Climate Resilience and Regeneration Plan. So if you're actually taking something right out of our Climate Re Resilience and Regeneration Plan and implementing it, then we'd all like to know that as well. And that should count as uh, something that's, that's um, supporting reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. Then just space to list that in more detail would be the next step down. Oh, I will say, um, I'm gonna pause just for a minute and go to the first worksheet here. There's an introduction page, which talks about uh, the mayor's focus on trying to reach net zero. Um, and that's why we're looking at these, these things. Um, some instructions on how to fill the form out, but then there's a list of city policies and plans with links to them down below. So um, if they're, they're a question about it, then they can go out and they can actually look, at, look and see the policies. Okay, in question five, specify greenhouse gas emission reduction pathway from the Sustainable Northampton Plan. This one, we basically cite editing of language. This is, these are all the categories that came out of the Climate Resilience and Regeneration Plan. Reduce energy demand, increase efficiency and conservation, increase electricity from renewable and low carbon sources, net zero energy buildings, electrification of thermal loads, supports non-automotive transport, transport, walking, bicycling, et cetera. People don't normally think of putting in a sidewalk as a greenhouse gas reduction, but it is because <laughs> it gets people out of cars. Um, uh, electric vehicle deployment, high mile per gallon gasoline or diesel vehicles. That's the case there's no EV available. Land use patterns, carbon sequestration and offsets, carbon budgeting and city operations, and other, if so they have another, another way, something else out of the sustainable Northampton plan. Um, does this investment help build a resilient city? So this is the one, this is really the um, only the one question that we have that gets on the resilience side, uh, as opposed to the mitigation side. Um, but again, what we did is we dove into the Climate Resilience and Regeneration Plan. And I won't read all of these, but these are all of the features that were in more of the resilient side. So if you're implementing something of, along that line, whether it expands resilient and connected landscapes, whether it promotes knowledge and skills for addressing climate change, I could read through the whole list, but we've got it all in the plan. Um, if you're implementing anything from that plan, we should know about it. Um, even though it's not directly possibly going to release reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So select it from the list and then give us a little bit of description to it. So that's what we've got uh, this time around. Um, should be open to hearing questions or, or um, comments folks have on this, um, maybe for next year. And I know Marissa and Gordon, we never did get a meeting on this, but I assume that the subcommittee We'll probably um, uh, meet at some point and um, give further guidance. Yeah, thank you. I, I want to say this this looks great. I was um, I did feel like we could get something together that would be helpful for the department heads this year, and this looks great. And it will give us a, a I think to to see how as they respond to it in in action um, will be a great jumping off point for for next year and for something that you know, we, we can use as a, as a long-term um, look. So this is great. I appreciate that. Okay, great. Uh, Eric? I got to unmute, sorry. Um, just real quick, and then I have a question. Um, at some point, it would be great if, others could see this, I realize it's probably a internal city doc and not appropriate for others to <laughs> interact with, but um, uh, operationally. Um, so just the question is, you know, let's say you do something like uh, change uh, 
reseed a meadow or something with with uh, some kind of better carbon sink planting, but it requires ongoing care from uh, you know that might increase the amount of uh, fossil fuels used, let's say, to maintain it or so I'm getting at the question of operational greenhouse gas emissions, which isn't in capital improvement, but is there a way to, and I realize this is sort of a, for next year probably, but just thinking about, is there a way to uh, express the operational loads on our emissions or energy usage that within the anticipated uh, usage of, of whatever is being install so that's that's my question comment thanks okay thank you yeah i mean just to clarify that this is i mean as you said this is a capital um budget planning process so it's not for operations um but you know from an operational standpoint i think that's what the plan is um suggesting is you know from a policy perspective and a and a departmental management perspective, we need to be thinking about all of these things. But this one particular piece of that puzzle is sort of for that long-term, those long-term capital investments for equipment and so forth. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Eric, I would say I, I, um, I think it's a really good point. It is a little bit why we were asking, does this best expand savings or maintain current levels of services? So, uh, you know, there's, there's a little bit of there trying just to kind of understand what is what each investment is. Um, you know, is is you know, so planting. I would, I guess, I would say, if you were planting a bunch of, just take your example, um, you know, carbon absorbing plants somehow, that you're expanding services. <laughs> but um, but um, that's getting a little bit off the point. Uh, I, I think it's a really good point, just um, operational, um, which is largely what we try to do at the moment, is trying to keep our operational emissions low through energy efficiency and stuff. Yeah, and I, I would say that that's also a great point, Eric, um, and that, that maybe there is somewhere, as Chris mentioned, that we could capture that in this. And I can tell you from my experience that that kind of operational cost change is something that we consider, uh, at least in things that I've done with the city on the uh, mowing subcommittee, a big part of the wildflower planting uh, idea is that those uh, fields that we convert from mowed over to wildflowers would then not have to be mowed anymore and it would significantly reduce operational cost and operational greenhouse gases. So we'd be going from uh, a monthly mowing to a biennial, uh, biannual, so every two years uh, mowing. So that that and that was something that Rich really uh, thought was important in in the consideration of the process. So so Rich is certainly looking out for that kind of thing. Great, thank you. I I, I think I my example is a little bit <laughs> weird, but you, know, you can imagine a building that that might require cleaning or something at a higher rate of use. You know, so it, it's a, it's a general question. I appreciate everybody's attention to that. Thanks. Right. If I just add on um, a, a thought here, just because I kind of feel like I'm I'm the one who's like we got to do something this year. Um, just to keep in mind the purpose of what this this is, this questionnaire is, it is for the department heads to present to this appointed um, uh, uh, committee um, to make recommendations to the mayor for capital improvements projects. It's it is I, I don't I don't think in that context um, it, it'll be all that helpful um, to to those of us on the committee as speaking as somebody who's done this, and I think I'm on tap to do it again um, to get that far in the weeds. I do think. Perhaps a general question uh, in the as general as what is already there um, to think about. I mean, because really, at the end of the day, it's just, dear department head, did you think about it? Did you think through the process? How does this fit in? If it does, um, and then it's in the implementation that I think the nitty gritty gets down in terms of like operating and 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 how it and actually plays out. So um, I would just offer that insight from being on the receiving end of exactly what this form, you know, who this form is for. Terrific. 
Therese. Hi, I'm sorry, I can't raise my electronic hand. Um, and so is there feedback to the department heads at any point in this process? And who would that be from? Um, well, I, I, I'll take a stab at that. So during this, this process, the department, there's very large uh, package of all the capital improvement projects that um, are being, you know, um, proposed and thought about by department heads, and they are kind of laid out, not just for what they want immediately, but going a, a few years into the future. And then, um, and they and then the committee prioritizes them and of course the mayor can then do whatever she wants um and then the final process of that is that it then comes before the council and finance committee and things like that for approval at that level so there's actually several layers of of feedback um and it does but i will say it does start in this um meeting um in this with the initial proposal and part of where this i think this um, this form came from in this discussion of it is because last year when we were going through this process, we were saying, you know, have you thought about an energy, you know, a sustainable vehicle? Have you thought about electric? Have you, and, and you know, not, it's not on them, but, you know, many department heads were like, I didn't even look. And then, and then they, and so the answer is, is yes. Then they came back with sort of adjustments to their proposals that did think about whether or not there was a, a more sustainable um, option available. Um, and sometimes, you know, the answer is this isn't a sustainability project. This isn't what this is about. Um, but it it did, even just asking the question last year prompted department heads to think harder about it. And I think this form will cue them up to, to about what kinds of questions they should be asking themselves. I, and that's why I'm really glad to see it. I think it's really helpful. I hope that answered your question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think that does clarify. It. And is some of that in like in lieu of direct input from the Sustainability Commission to the department heads? Is this, are you working towards that or is this just a different way of getting the department heads to kind of think on their own about the options? Um, I guess I would say that it's this is the very the most preliminary part of the process. Um, and again, it's just a recommendation. So as things then are then put forward for funding by the mayor and make their way into that process, you know, then then they might, you know, come into this committee's purview. Not, I mean, I, Rachel, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, I don't think it's necessarily by referral from council for this to think about, but it's on the agendas, the capital improvement projects are part of the budgetary process and um, and what they are and what they are entailed gets explained in the, in the course of the council budgeting process and then finance meeting and things like that. Um, and we can, it seems to me this committee can take up and to talk about what, you know, whatever we want to, if we want to pipe in. Okay, thank you. I can respond to that and and Ben I know you had your hand up but just I mean it's this the idea about getting feedback from this commission to sort of help structure the application process essentially for department heads so it's really not meant to be the Energy and Sustainability Commission evaluates all capital um, requests that's not the process the process is really already established in terms of identifying capital expenditures to go on the capital plan, but we wanted to add this lens and this ability for department heads to think about what their requests mean in terms of long-term um, um, impacts or addressing goals in the plan. And so this commission was charged with helping to sift through that and create that framework. And that's the extent of this piece. Sorry, Ben, I jumped in front of you. No, that's, that's fine because I think we're, we're all kind of echoing the same thing. I, I just wanna compliment Chris and whoever else helped him develop this thing. I think it's great. <laughs> because the purpose is, I mean, ideally, nobody needs an energy sustainability commission because everybody is always kind of thinking about and has enough knowledge about uh, those questions that they apply it in all their different roles. 
So if if this uh, form causes a department head to say, I don't know how to answer this. I'm going to ask Chris if he has any ideas. Then that department head is going to learn something and develop a change in culture and a change in thinking, which will kind of duplicate itself over and over. And then there'll be learning experiences where one department learns from another about the availability of a vehicle they didn't know about. And that sort of thing helps itself. So I think this is a, a really great tool for culture change. Um, yeah, so yay, Chris, well done. <laughs> I do wanna just kind of point of, uh, of what the city actually funds. So there's, there's many other ways that funds kind of happen just through operational budgets, through grants, um, stuff like that. So we're only touching on a, a certain number of objects here at best. But yes, thanks for the feedback, Ben. All right. Is that it on that one? Um, I guess we're down to city councilor uh, reports. Rachel, you up? Yeah, yeah. I just we wanted to follow up. We uh, kind of ran out of time, and also we, we didn't have um, a lot of folks with us at the last time, last meeting when we talked about um, the, the climate director position and the idea of that. And I actually really want to hear. You know, the uh, Maura Healy has has stated that she's going to be having a very similar role that that reports directly to the governor. And so I'd love to hear from members of NASC, you know, what they think of this idea and also just how it would feel um, to them in terms of operationally, if there was uh, an autonomous kind of position that reported to the mayor versus someone who was housed under, you know, the, the energy and sustainability, or, you know. Um, so I'd like to know how that would feel, especially from the department heads because the roles in general have been autonomous of the departments and report directly to you know, the mayor. So I'm just curious about that aspect. So really I'd like to hear from all of you um, and answer any questions as well. And we also have our lovely members of the public who are um, involved in this. So, so yeah, if each, of, if each of you could just say maybe your thoughts on, on, the, on what you're thinking about the the, you know, the round paper or the climate and or the climate director and also about where the, if we did have a role like that, where it should be housed and how that would work for you. I would love to hear that. I, mean, I can certainly start. I've had, a, I've had this conversation several times with several different groups of people. And, um, you know, I think that there are pluses and minuses to having, um, a position that sort of directing broadly sustainability um, if it's in the mayor's office um, you know there's some benefit that that person then might have more stature to direct other department heads in certain ways or have more um, ability to encourage movement in one direction or another um, but at the same time, that just means that there, you know, there's no guarantee that that position stays when the mayor changes. Um, so, it, you know, it's more of a political position than um, a um, staff, you know, position that's um, part of the general, uh, you know, staffing for the city. Um, I think that I don't think that it makes sense to have a separate office. Um, that seems like a big expenditure of resources to create a whole nother sort of set of infrastructure pieces for um, one person um, or an, and there are um, people sort of working in departments that are have pieces of this um, puzzle that they're already working on. So I think it makes sense to have, um, you know, a position and 
I think it needs to be more broader than energy. I think energy is a piece of the whole sustainability picture. And there's a lot of, um, you know, aspects to that. So I don't think that it should be, um, I think that the person, whoever it is, needs to have sort of a broad sense of um, a lot of the sustainability um, components, you know, transportation and stormwater and, um, and energy and, you know, land use. So, um, and housing and, and all of those pieces, I'll at least touch on all of those and, and be able to connect with all the departments that are involved in with those. Um, and one of, and so, um, but there's certainly lots of examples around the country of um, where these uh, people sit, you know, they're in departments, either in the mayor's office or in the city manager's office or in the planning office or um, even in public works. Um, so I, I guess, um, you know, I certainly think that it makes, it could make sense in the planning office. So I won't deny that. I think that that's a good spot for it, but, you know, I think ultimately um, it's the mayor's decision um, about where, you know, she thinks that should be. Carolyn. Mm -hmm. Yeah, others? I, I would love, to, yeah. Yeah. But I just think this is something that's going to grow. I mean, it almost, almost organically, the evolution of this commission, the evolution of uh, Chris Mason's job is headed, headed that way already. And you know, we don't need so much to recreate as maybe just steer a little bit. Um, there's a lot of resources here on the commission. And, um, you know, I think we could maybe steer something out of the commission um, or put something forward um, based on just what we all know. Um, no, I don't think anybody here, um, not to disparage anybody here, could could step up and do the whole thing at this point. It's going to have to have some kind of a structure around um, the person who becomes the um, the sort of the voice, uh, the person that has the the important ear in the city. Um, so, but I think we it can come out of this group. But I don't know if we want to try to. Um, um, start from square one or let it just evolve. And um, while I've got the floor, I'll nominate Chris Mason for the position. <laughs> but then we'd have to backfill his position. Because I think the point is, you know, we need at least <laughs> one more body who's just focused on the whole thing and not, you know. Clone Chris. We need Chris Clone running around the city. How about you, Chris? How do you feel about where, you know, the struck operationally about where a position like that would, would be housed? And well, I, I agree with Carolyn that it has to be a very broad position. I mean, I, I see right. that, that position I see as being basically take the climate resilience and regeneration plan, and it's your job to help department heads um, report back, you know, kind of get information back, just to kind of keeping track, making sure that we're staying on track, um, identify where things aren't, aren't happening, um, you know, not in a, in a kind of regulatory hard way, but as a just someone to kind of give it a large focus. And because it can, because it has to be so broad, and I do agree, I don't think you need a new department um with the whole structure um i think you i think you do need to have the you know the the knowledge that this person is speaking for the mayor for the city you know via the plan that the city has adopted and for the mayor because the mayor wants to implement this um that needs to be part of who they are who that position who, what that position is but they could be in any office um, I mean, you could try to pick which officer is going to be the most busy, you know, um, uh, right now, my position, 
um, you know, it's supposed to be, my position has aspects of it that don't belong in central services. Um, you know, when I do a solarized program or heat smart program, um, when I'm helping, uh, you know, there's different, different places where my position right now doesn't fit there. But a lot of what I do, because I do work on energy and facilities directly, is in central services. So it's a, it makes sense for my position right now to be there. It might be that the director's position would continue to be there. That would be its main piece. Or it may be that a lot of what they're going to be doing is working with the planning department. Um, you know, so I, I think the position could be anywhere because they're going to be working with all departments anyhow. Um, and if you're going to pick a spot for it to be, try to kind of guess where it's going to be heavily involved. And that would make sense because, you know, but other, quite frankly, on a practical point of view, the other problem is the city is running out of office spaces. I don't know, I don't know where you put the new person. Um, yeah. Resilience hub. <laughs> if we ever get that resilience. Right, it has more, more office space. Um, uh, going back to what, you know, the presenters gave last week uh, as they kind of wrap things up, I thought, but I'm trying to remember, I, I hope I'm not misspeaking here, but I thought their advice was pretty good all the way around. So I thought they, they kind of identified a number of good points for the position. But now I couldn't go back and tell you exactly which ones unless I had that piece of paper in front of me. Um, so that's my thoughts at, at the moment. Yeah, um, I guess I'm, am I calling on people? Um, Gordon? Go for it. I don't know. Um, uh, I apologize if I'm chopping my internet. It's been going in and out. Uh, I was going to say that I really feel like it's critical that the person who goes in this position has project development and project management experience, someone who is going to actually be focused on getting things done. We don't need another person uh, recording data points that is not going to get us anywhere fast enough to actually accomplish the goal of becoming resilient in time for us to really need it. We need somebody who is going to be driving projects, big projects, and that's going to tie in a little bit to what I'm going to be discussing during my presentation today about working with the utility companies. We need someone who really understands uh, energy production, storage, efficiency, project management, engineering, finance. We need somebody who really understands the nuts and bolts that get things done. Uh, we don't need to look at the problem anymore. We need to do something about it. And that person has to drive that action. Right. And I, you know, I, that's why my concern is, you know, you always want to give authority with responsibility. And so if it is going to be that broad like that and involve many departments, I mean, why not have it be part of the mayor's office? I just, I think this person needs to have authority and be a, have some amount of uh, autonomy um, from agendas. Uh, so yeah, but that's a great point about the project uh, management experience. We have to, that's a, that could be a pitfall that we need to really manage is we really need to, we need something new. We're, we're looking for something new here. We're not looking to, to, to repeat, you know, things that we've, got, we've tried in the past. So I that's a, thank you for that, Gordon. Um, can I just add to that? Because I think it's not just getting projects done, but it's going from, you know, start to finish and start really is looking at what the opportunities are, where, you know, starting with the big, you know, we have identified sort of biggest bang for the buck kind of thing, but we need someone who can keep their eye on all the potential funding opportunities, go after those funding opportunities with a proposed project, and then see that project through. So it's not just, you know, receiving the project and going, it's actually, you know, from start to finish. Yeah, I'm going to jump on on what Gordon said too, because it, it kind of leads. Up. So um, along with getting projects and, the, and also actually kind of going along with Carolyn saying, this constant strategic look at where at where the city is doing, um, because you know projects actually won't roll out the way you think they will, um, and you know planning doesn't happen the way you think it will. So you constantly have to look at it again. So what's the best way forward here? Um, that has to be part of what they're doing, and. You know, the city's department heads and stuff are busy doing what they need to do 
right now, you know, long term. They, they're what, what were they hired to do? They, their hands are already full. So, so someone to help the whole city kind of look at us strategically. Where are we going? Um, which I think, is, Carolyn, is kind of what you were saying too. I see Adele has her hand up. Thank you. Um, I agree with uh, with everything that uh, has been said here, and it really sounds like quite a big job. But I'm I'm want to add to it that um, it's not just about municipal departments and municipal buildings. This is really about our entire city. And so um, I think that this position needs to not only be strategic about municipal uses of energy, et cetera, um, but also to help raise the consciousness and provide assistance to private building owners and, um, and others in our community who are responsible for by far the most of our emissions. So I just want to make sure that that gets thrown into the mix. Thank you. Thank you for that. I see, um, that's a great point. I see Councillor Elkins and then I see Joyce. Uh, Councillor Elkins, did you want? Uh, yeah, I, th I think Adele just made a, a, a great point. I, I, and I think that, um, I think that argues in favor of, of, of putting it in the mayor's office, because that also goes hand in hand with um, um, sort of the role of business development and those kinds of aspects that there's, you know, not governmental, but there's a role for it to be, you know, for the city to play um, in a more overarching sort of big picture kind of way. So, um, and I guess I, I just also like the, uh, I, I think it really is at that level where you get um, the kind of culture change that is infusing through every department and every decision, the, the just saying, you need to think about this. We need, this is our, you know, our, our, uh, our, our what's, I don't know what word I'm so looking for, but like, this is, this is what we hew to in all of our decisions. Um, I, my only fear about that is, you know, you have a different mayor with different priorities. Um, and you know the what if it goes away you know but that's maybe a political problem not a mm. no. thanks um it's let's see I, I see joyce joyce did you want to make a comment yes and i'm trying to get my camera to work but it's, oh, here it is, okay. Um, a couple of things. One, almost everything that everyone commented on, um, those issues uh, or those uh, functions are in our job description. Um, so uh, all of these things are being considered in the creation of a draft of a job description that we're giving to the mayor. The other thing is, well, it seems that in this climate, no pun intended, it would be political suicide for someone to come and get rid of a climate crisis director position. Um, and if they do, then they can, uh, uh, something else can be proposed and can happen. I don't think we should live in fear of what's going to happen from someone that we don't know at some point in the future. So those are my, two of my comments thus far. Thank you. Thank you, Joyce. So this item was just a feedback item and request, right? So no action is necessary on that. Um, so um, I just want I wonder if we, since we've got still a couple more things to discuss, I wonder if it makes sense to move on after Eric's um, comment. Right, that, that's right. I, I, at some point, I might be hitting you up for an endorsement vote, but we wanted to really um, hash it out a little bit before we went you brought that up. So I'm satisfied with that after Eric speaks. Thank you. 
I'm sorry. I, I won't. This isn't long. I, on next door Florence recently, there was a request for people to provide information, any information about heat pumps. And uh, it brought to mind that many towns are now hiring energy coaches, which is potentially a separate role. But that uh, this is backing up at Dell's point. There's a lot of uh, knowledge transfer that and education that needs to occur to help move the residential greenhouse gas component down. And that's not being, I mean, I, I, we all could say something to this person, but it's, it points out a much larger need um, that there is. So thank you. Okay, thanks, Eric. Is that it on that, I think. Um, all right, department head report. Louie, you're up, building code. Um, so Adele uh, mentioned it already, but uh, um, this is a this is a, a moving target. Um, the the building code is getting com essentially completely revised. The energy code is being uh, rewritten, not not necessarily revived. I mean, not necessarily revised rewritten start from nothing different um uh, statute that authorizes it coming out of a different cmr so and both processes are um having trouble getting to the end um the um the recently pre presented final final energy code has run up against some fairly significant resistance and um, the the energy code is um, was is uh, I'm confused because I took in an awful lot of information lately so um, bear with me a little um, the energy code should be uh, promulgated by the by December 31st and come into full force and effect on January 1st. Doesn't look like that's going to happen now because of a couple of, of uh, objections that have been raised. The, the, the new building code, which is which integrates, which has its own set of energy conservation aspects, but but also integrates the DOER energy code is not going to be finished until and the most recent thing i saw is uh may or june so we're going to have an energy code that's in place um and radically different from the existing energy code um without without coordination to, to the new building codes I think it's going to be terribly confusing, um, and it was it was frustrating today. Let me just uh, rather than share, I'm just going to uh, look at my screens. Um, but the uh, the mass amendments to the, the the building code amendments for the residential. Um, energy code, which are primarily um, written for towns that aren't going to adopt the stretch code or aren't going to adopt, that aren't green communities, aren't going to use the stretch code, aren't going to adopt the uh, uh, stretch code, the extended stretch code. Um, there's 16 pages. Um, the um, Oh, let me read a little bit of this. Um, let's see. So 
So, and then, and, and the last thing to, to mention is that the stretch code is one of the most complicated codes uh, for, that I've seen in the, it's way more complicated than the building, than the various sections of the building code. Um, and so I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be problematic um, to implement. I'm not sure, um, I mean, I've been looking at building codes for a long time and I never saw one with more words that I, and acronyms that I, that I just don't understand and spend an awful lot of time looking up. I mean, um, there's two factors. One's called EUI and one's called TEDI. And they're, they're very, it took me a long time to find out what TEDI even stood for, but it's two different aspects of energy use. One is the ultimate energy use of a space and the other is the intensity of the energy use in the space and trying to balance the energy code is forcing designers to balance both pieces. It used to be presented sort of a, um, a prescriptive uh, solution to the code requirements and it doesn't seem like that's going to happen anymore. The, the, there's almost an infinite number of ways to get there um, and ultimately getting there isn't altogether clear to me. The, so I think it's going to be, I think there's going to be a, uh, um, a, it's going to be a very confusing six months or so until it gets sorted out. The confusion may go on farther than that. And then another factor that I'm not sure um, that I know there's a lot of discussion about. I'm not sure how much DOER thought about, but the con there's traditionally with the building code a concurrency period because as the code changes, projects take, you know, it can be a year in development as the code changes. Um, there's an opportunity to look at the new regulations and either build to them or continue your development under the old code, um, that's not going to happen with the DOER code. So we're going to have major changes uh, January 1st for projects that have been under development for a year and a half. Um, and some of the pieces of um, some of the pieces that have existed sort of traditionally in the building code where if you did this, then you didn't have to do that uh, because you're already so far along. You get something approved, it's not liable to change. The sense is that the DOER energy code is not, doesn't have all those things built into it. I have no idea what's going to happen when somebody goes down to get a building permit for a, a large building that's been designed under the current code on January 3rd? Are they going to have to go back to the drawing board, back literally back to the drawing board? Uh, because that was yesterday and now it's tomorrow. Um, and a lot, an awful lot of those questions are just simply unanswered at this point. There's, um, as best I can uh, slog through the various, um, some of them are, are draft, some of them are proposed final versions, which then have been kicked back for um, reconsideration on some levels. Um, and again, I, I don't know how the coordination is gonna, is gonna go on. Um, little, some of it is little, it, some of it seems little, but in, this, in, in, in the end, it, it ends up not being particularly little is that we're looking at air, the, the conflicts between air sealing and, and uh, 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 fire separation and fire protection. And 
the, the materials that people want to use, it's nickel and dime, but the materials that people want to use in the corner of an apartment where on, on the wall that adjoins the next apartment. Um, and stand there pointing and waving and I saw a pretty, pretty significant argument break out about we have to do it this way. No, you can't do it that way. Blah, blah, blah. It worked, got worked out, but it was, it was, uh, those are the kinds of things that are going to come up when you start laying in new codes and codes that aren't necessarily uh, as well coordinated with other codes as, as they might have been if they'd been done a different way. So I'm just afraid that um, we're going to be into a, a very um, confusing period. And I think that the, the goals are going to end up working out, but I think it's going to be hard to get there. That's, that was my take on it at this point. Um, and I see Adele has her hand up, and I know that she's been watching it too. And I wonder what she, her input is. Well, I, I just wanted to add to what you said. I, I, I totally agree um, that it's going to be confusing, and you know a heck of a lot more about building codes than I ever will. But um, but I do know one thing uh, that I just w would like to contribute to this discussion, which is that um, there is a provision. Once a, you know, as you know, there's two stretch codes. There's this regular stretch code. Um, and then there's going to be an opt-in stretch code, which is um, a little more rigorous. And um, I do know that there is a provision with the opt-in stretch code um, that once a city council or a town council um, approves the opt-in stretch code, there's a six-month delay in implementation. So, you know, six months is better than nothing. Uh, from from the point of view of a of a developer, but um, just thought I would point that out. Thanks. It gets so confusing because there's um, there's there's. Let me see if I can find one of them. Um, and I think I I uh, one of the one of the sections are, are, uh, from the. 10th edition of the building code. Um, and it's from the energy code chapter of the building code. Um, it says that uh, this chapter, this and it's the residential energy code, energy code chapter of the building code. This chapter applies to residential buildings. Municipalities which have adopted the stretch code or the municipal opt-in specialized stretch energy code shall use energy efficiency requirements of those codes and chapter 51 of this or this chapter as applicable. Well, when you when you go back through the two chapters in the building code, you find conflicts with the, the DOER energy codes and the DOER energy codes don't only apply to the stretch code communities. It is it is an energy code that seems to have an awful lot of things that are that come in before towns even opt into the to the um, stretch code or the or the energy stretch code. I also wonder, and I hadn't had enough time to figure out whether or not a, a stretch code community like Northampton doesn't have the option of, they may be able to um, opt into the, to the extended energy code, but I don't, I think they are stuck already in the, um, in the stretch code piece of it. Um, and once you, and once this, once it starts, once you start getting into the weeds on it, um, I'm pretty sure that we're going to end up that that even on single family homes, because there's not a really specific prescriptive path that if you do X, Y, Z, A, B, and C, you're going to pass um, yet. There may be at some point somebody will develop one, but right now there's not. Um, it's going to be it's going to be um, engineers that are designing um, 
the energy conservation and use um, aspects of, of new houses, just new houses, ne never mind um, commercial buildings. Um, and I'm hoping that this doesn't get out of control. I'm hoping that we can figure out a way to, um, let me just, one thing that happened already and that um, sort of went by the wayside is that the, the Board of Building Regulations and Standards were working on the 2000, 18 amendments, 2020 amendments to the energy code, and they hired the uh, International Code Council to write the Massachusetts 2020 Energy Conservation Code, but then it never went anywhere. I mean, you can buy the books, but they, they're they irrelevant because things have already changed. So just because they start down a path doesn't mean that that's necessarily uh there won't be some detours along the way um a lot to say that basically says i got no idea what's going to happen <laughs> i'm i'm interested to wait and see but um so far um not much to report on that that you could take to the bank appreciate the report Louie. Yeah, such as it is. Anybody wants a lot of information, email them to just let me know because I have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages of compare this to that and see what you come up with and read these two comparisons and see if you can find, see if you think they're even talking about the same two things. So. And it turns out, one last thing, it turns out that the West Coast, the Western provinces in Canada might be at the very forefront of these kinds of energy improvements. So, I'm done. Ellen, you're muted. Looks like a comment from John Hansel, thanks, Ben, and then Ben. <laughs> no, my question is who's going to be able to afford these houses? <clears throat> houses right now are so astronomically high, cost of materials, scarcity of materials. Who's going to be able to afford these? I mean, Louis looked into it. That's my question. Thanks. All right, Ben, you're up. Um, uh, well, the, I, I mean, the answer is, is you will, and all of us will, <laughs> once we figure out the details of how, of all the stuff that Louis described as confusing. <laughs> um, and if it remains confusing, then things will also be expensive because confusion causes expense. Um, but we've generally seen that the upcharge for a, to go from a code as of, you know, last year, to a passive house is about 10%. And 10% can be a lot in some cases, but it's a whole lot less than all the other factors that are causing houses to be expensive. Um, so, you know, I, I feel like it's, it's a red herring to point at the energy code as the driver of expense when it's land and zoning and um, uh, house size, and a bunch of things where the economics are driving uh, driving towards other things. So that's that's just a response, uh, take it where it is. But I think what Louis is pointing up is this confusion and kind of this impending, uh, you know, that we see this coming. And if Louis is confused, then a lot of other people are gonna be confused. Um, so my question is, on the one hand, I can talk to some people at DOER and see what they're planning on doing, but what can we do? Let's let's assume that a bunch of us, including Louis, are able to work our way through this so that we become unconfused, right? Let's assume that that were that that's possible. Um, what could we do as a city to eliminate the confusion early? And, and to basically make, make it 
make it attractive to build here because it's so unconfusing. <laughs> well, one of the one of the things that that um, the the uh, the more we figure out, the more people are going to be coming to us because there's a huge need for information, and um, I think that. I've always felt like the first person that can get an idea on a piece of paper, two thirds of a piece of paper, that has a huge advantage, and they're it's they're more likely to have that plan. So the quicker we can get looking at it, the quicker we begin to understand it. We may be able to propose some kind of a prescriptive mechanical uh, envelope uh, set of set of criteria that if that shows that lets people price out um the easily price out the difference between um uh, air source heat pumps and uh air source water heaters um as opposed to um you know what what they might the less expensive all options um but the more we can get on a piece of paper the the more valuable it's going to be to other people, and the more people are going to be um, asking us questions. And if we get into a situation where we're providing answers, we we start to get ahead of the game. And hopefully, eventually, DOER um, will will listen. Um, I know that several years ago there were some uh, problems with the early early part of the seventh edition of the code and um, a few building inspectors worked together to um, and sent some language to Boston and like an hour later it was in the code and and it made things easier for people so just raising the issue um, and we're in a good position to be able to do that I think the the energy commission is <clears throat> That's great. I, I would also say that as we see destabilization happening in the world and the cost of energy input going up, we have to look at the cost difference between building, uh, building efficiency into a building to begin with and the cost of paying utilities in an inefficient building. And I think that if we compare those two things, we quickly find that it is actually more cost effective to spend that extra 10% up front when you're building the building than it is to be spending 50% uh, extra on utility bills every month over the course of 30 years. I mean, that's, that's not that hard a calculation to make. Great. Anything else on this one before we move to our final agenda item? All right. I guess that puts you up, Gordon. Okay, great. Um, I wanted to have a conversation about our electrical grid and its level of resilience. Uh, kind of as a reflection upon the conversation that we had with national grid about six months ago when they came on to discuss all of the subsidies available to residents of the city and while i thought that that was nice for us to hear that i didn't really feel like it was necessarily uh pointing our attention as a city in a direction where we need to be looking to address the broader issues with the grid that we have facing us. So what I wanted to do was take a step back uh, and give everyone an overview of our existing grid and where our grid is likely to be going so that we can be better focused on how do we intersect with that change in a way to capitalize on the needs of the utility company to change our grid and our resources that we can bring to the table to help the utility company get that done for us and for our residents. 
So I'm going to read off of something uh, on my screen because it makes it easier for me. So I'm going to be off of this page and not be able to see you. So uh, if you raise your hand, I apologize. I won't see you for a second while I'm reading what I've written uh, and I'll be back with you. Uh, Gordon, do you want to share your screen at the same time so we can read you know, along? Honestly, I find it so complicated. This is my only Zoom okay. meeting that I have, which I take as a great blessing. <laughs> uh, so I'm really looking forward to us getting back to in person, but I am still very clumsy with Zoom. So I'm just going to read off my screen and I'll be, I'll be here if someone wants to shout out. All right. So our current grid is a vertical and highly centralized system, which creates many points of potential failure. Uh, an incident at any one failure point, which could be a transmission line, it could be a substation, it could be a step up station, it could be a step down station, it could be local transformers, uh, it can be anywhere throughout the system. But because our system goes from the power plant to a step up station, along transmission lines, a step down station, through a local grid and out to our houses, an interruption or a problem at any one of those points will cause everything downstream of it to fail. And so the system itself is not inherently resilient to all of the things that we're facing. So disasters that we are looking at could be human caused, such as state actors or individual saboteurs. For instance, in the early 2000s, a man with a rifle in California who targeted a transformer station caused long-term power outages that cost tens of millions of dollars to fix. And he did it with nothing but a rifle. Um, Currently, we see Russia targeting power infrastructure across Ukraine as a principal means of attack in war. Uh, these attacks need not be limited to physical attacks. Uh, the US Department of Defense announced publicly only three years ago that any state actor has the capability to significantly cripple an adversary's grid through cyber attacks there are a lot of potential state actors. Uh, though a matter of concern, uh, natural disasters are far more likely than acts of human sabotage. Uh, natural disasters in our area are most likely to be hurricanes or snow and ice storms. And these storms are going to get far more severe than they are now. So we need to act to secure our system and reduce the point of failure in expectation of this. So natural disasters are precisely the time that we need secure power sources for our critical infrastructure. And our current system of diesel generators is understandable due to the past availability of alternatives, but in the face of what is about to become our knowledge of the failure rates of diesel generators, our continued reliance upon them for future needs is frankly irresponsible. In a study of the reliability of diesel generators to supply continuous power to critical resources conducted by the Department of Defense, the following results were found. The failure rate of diesel generators is 20% at startup. 20% more fail within 30 minutes, and an additional 20% fail within 24 hours of running. So if you do the math real quick, that means that when we're doing our resilience planning and looking at our facilities that are backed up by diesel generators, that we, if we are being truthful and responsible, need to factor in a 50% failure rate within 24 hours, which means that if that failure happens somewhere like our emergency dispatch center, uh, 
we're going to lose that facility and not be able to direct all of our critical uh, operations right in the middle of a disaster. I think it's important that we ask ourselves as a city, are we really comfortable with diesel generators being our only source of backup power at critical sites? I am not. The future grid that we need and the future that we must aspire to build will give us a secure grid which distributes energy production and storage across itself along with hardware and software that's able to direct power and isolate failure points. The most secure point to store energy is at the end user. The future energy, sorry, pardon me, the further energy is stored from the end user, the more points of failure that separate the end user to access to the energy required to run the critical infrastructure. The future grid will store energy at its endpoints and in regionally accessible points within the system. These storage points will be recharged by distributed means of production, such as solar PV, wind, and quite likely small package nuclear. These production and storage facilities will be connected by a system of transmission lines, switches, and other hardware and software that will allow for a two-way flow of electricity through the grid. With this new system, the utility company will become a manager of energy as well as a part of the energy supply. And that energy management will really become the utility's principal role. We must, let's see, pardon me, lost my place again. With all of this change coming, there's a great opportunity for us to use our city assets in cooperation with the utility company to help build the new grid that we need. So we have to ask ourselves, how can we be a part of the solution? Can we site energy storage and production at city facilities or on land that the city owns? Can modern storage and switch beer gear be used to build greater resilience for the city's critical infrastructure and for our community? And can we design systems that keep us operational in the face of climate disasters? Most importantly, or a good bit of it, is what would it be worth to the utility company for us to act as a partner for them? Can they pay for these improvements or can they finance it for us? I think that it is almost certain that the utility companies are looking for opportunities to build resilience into their systems. As a city, we have an opportunity now to examine what our future needs are and how can we be a real part of that. So with that, I will switch my face back to you guys. Um, <laughs> I have been gone for a minute. Uh, so <laughs> I, I just wanted to kind of like give give like an overview of what's going on. The grid as it is right now is about to change dramatically. It has to, because it will not continue to function properly. It's old and defunct. There's been a ton of money given by Congress to do a lot of upgrades, but the utility companies are going to be looking for opportunities to uh, site storage, to site uh, probably switch gear and stuff to site generation. And the question is like, how can we eliminate points of critical failure within the system that serves our residents? What can, what can we do? And if we get in now and we get involved in the game with the utility companies, what is it worth to them? Because they need this stuff to happen too. So Ben, you have a question or a comment? Well, I, I think this is exactly right. And particularly with cities, that there are a bunch of things that, that that type of customer can organize with the utility. Um, particularly, we're talking about the ability to arbitrage. 
Um, so this that's it. It gets to resilience because you've got some sort of form of storage, and also demand side management. But the idea is that if you can participate on the uh, five minute market or the one hour market for electricity, you can make your battery pay for itself. And then the utility would may want to help you pay for that battery by saying that it can deploy your battery when necessary to, to manage the grid. Um, I did a study for the town of Weston um, which has a, a challenge for, they've got this kind of a uh, complex of, of a bunch of schools and it has a uh, very unreliable electricity. Um, and so we did a study where we looked at the ability to add photovoltaics and electric school buses. And the idea is the electric school buses, while they're not busy driving kids back and forth, are either charging from the photovoltaics when they would otherwise be exporting to the grid or they're uh, discharging to operate uh, the school system uh, in that, that particular design. And we, we, there's some great tools out there to measure your number of hours of grid outage that a certain battery size and PV could allow you to run. And we found that basically sizing the, the battery to be the school buses for their particular school bus routes plus the PV that you could simply fit on the roofs of the schools, let them run for a week with no, with the grid being down. So, um, so I think there's a big opportunity. When, the last thing I'll add to this again, because it's a city, because what we, we have is schools, the youth commission has already brought to the school board their desire and some organization with companies, you know, some discussion with companies of purchasing uh, EV school buses. So it's something we could potentially start to do with the city. You basically have a mobile generator. That's brilliant. Yeah, certainly vehicles, you know, people, people are going to be making these investments in vehicles. And as they uh, continue to have bigger and bigger batteries, those may actually become, you know, the storage, the, at least initially, for people's homes. And that gives that endpoint use. And then once the systems in place for the utility companies that allows them to draw out of those batteries power when they need it to feed the grid, it really does start to build a more resilient system. And certainly, for critical facilities, uh, we we can I, we should be able to island them and feed them power from a source like a bus and uh, and really have something that in the case of emergency we really truly do become resilient. I, I think that this was a big part of why uh, I was not okay with the notion of the resilience center not being resilient. It truly must be um, because like. Can you imagine uh, what what it would be like for elected officials should uh, the the desperate people of the city flock to the resilience center in the case of an emergency to find it with no power? I mean, do you, are you who wants to be responsible for that? Anyone? Not me. You know that's crazy. All right, uh, Chris. Yeah, thanks, Gordon. Um, um, all good points. Ben, I'd love to see your study. <laughs> um, well, anyhow, I'm just going to add a few things. Um, uh, and because I don't know exactly where your report was, was uh, getting its information from on the 20%, 20%, 20% failure rate. I do know that gen sets, they have to be practiced. They have to be exercised on a regular basis. So I have a feeling a good part of your 20% are people who don't do that. Yeah, that that's unclassified information from the Department of Defense. Okay, yeah, but I, I suspect a, bar, a good part of the failure rate. Um, I'm not positive if I'm right uh, here, but I'm uh, I'm trying to point out that you know the city had had you work. I, I think that in working with the Defense Department for a long time, I would say that 
um, they're pretty militant about keeping up with their operational schedules. And they, you know, what, if they're supposed to run the generator, there's a person to stand there and run it um, for a certain mm -hmm. amount of time. So I, I, maybe their big, big, ugly old generators that they had uh, weren't as good as ours. But if we're not planning for significant failure of those, we, we uh, you know, I, I understand why they're there, but what I'm saying is that going forward, that that's an it's an irresponsible way of backing power up for the city. And no, it's I, kind of crazy. Yeah, I'm I'm right with you there. Um, and if the DOER was, I mean, if the DOE was studying their own generators and they know that they were maintaining them well and stuff, and then you know the reason generators don't last for 24 hours is they're not designed for that. They're designed to, to run for an emergency period, but they're not meant to be a generator. They're not meant to be. So long outages are definitely going to be a problem. Um, and the other thing I just want to point out, uh, you know, from looking at putting a battery system at our fire headquarters with a PV array, we couldn't get it to price out no matter what we did. And part of the reason why is that at the moment, our batteries, the subsidies to help you put a big battery in are um, uh, in order to do load reduction peak load reduction. Um, and the problem is, if you're going to do peak load reduction, then you don't have a battery for backup because you might have the power go out when your battery is down. Um, so there's, uh, there, there's conflicts there in how you actually fund batteries because you're going to use it for one thing or you're going to use it for the other thing. And if you can't use it, you know some, some of the funds coming in. So just a few more things to toss in. Just structurally, as we're moving forward, they would have to be addressed. Um, but thanks for bringing this up. Yeah, thank you, Chris. All right, uh, Eric, I think you were next. Thanks, just real quick. Um, in my previous life, I was on the Energy Advisory Committee for the town of Harvard, and we had partnered with National Grid to study the efficacy of using a local storage array to do peak shaving and other load management in the high school. Um, so they do, they do, and, and they had a study and they funded equipment to do the, to do this. So they do do this. Um, I can forward any info I have on that to whoever would like, but yeah, thank you. Nice great, thing. great forward thinking. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Rachel. Yeah, just a couple things, you know, that was such an interesting point about the electric school buses because I've been on those those conversations you know for years now and it, it always gets back to costs and perhaps this is why we need that climate director to kind of look when you look at all costs you know the cost of not having a generator or not having access to um, and I guess uh, to just a couple a question was you know when I first ran on council you know three years ago there was a lot of talk about microgrids and microgrids are going to save us from you know massive power outages and i was just curious your thoughts on that and also like a city versus a regional approach you know i keep thinking about the community choice aggregate you know 3.0 i just wonder you know does that make it more easy to address the problem or does that make um, it or do you have to do it by city so yeah microgrids and also the city versus kind of local regional yeah, so, and, and I'm sure Ben might have some thoughts on this too. So one thing, um, a microgrid is a uh, set of uh, equipment and inputs and users. And so microgrids can kind of be built within the larger grid, I would think. Ben, maybe I'm wrong, but you know, you could essentially, the utility company can build microgrids into the larger grid. Uh, and you can build in islandable modes with uh, storage for critical infrastructure. So say we were working to build a, a microgrid uh, within the city that uh, had, uh, so a microgrid has uh, power generation, it has power storage, and it has distribution and switching, and it has an end use, a set of end users and you try to balance all of those things out. And so um, if we s come up with a plan with the utility company to uh, create a microgrid that covers a number of facilities and say that has to cover like a pretty good size neighborhood in order to, or region of the city in order to encompass all of those facilities, 
uh, then we would have to look at where within that system could we put in uh, production, where could we put in storage, where could we put in proper switching gear to make sure that it's going where it's supposed to, when it's supposed to, and, um, and then what facilities within that can be put into island mode to operate without the larger grid, uh, such as emergency dispatch, uh, you know, that's like the first thing that comes to mind and a resilient center. Um, and so that those things can operate without, you know, maybe that resilient center has a kitchen, you know, that's run on the battery so that, you know, God forbid, we have to feed a couple thousand people out of it. You know, that uh, you look at Florida, what, what just happened there, you know, a, a resilient center is critical. Um, and people are going to need to actually be able to use it and needs to actually be there for people when they need it. Otherwise, it, it's, it's, you know, just a bunch of posturing, you know, and so, so then as far as regionality and city goes, my, uh, my experiences have been in the financing side of that. So that's where it gets really tricky when you have multiple, uh, multiple municipalities with all their own authorities and you try to get six people you know six commissions to come together and make a decision that's just that's insanity it's no way to get things done quickly you know so while it would be great if national grid were to give you know this region enough ability to create a regional microgrid, but then all of a sudden it's not a microgrid anymore, you know? So uh, I think that going after it as a city and we can be a little bit, you know, um, I don't know, looking out for ourselves here, right? Not that the rest of the community and the other towns around us aren't just as important as we are, but the the utility companies are going to be looking for forward looking communities that say hey we want to be a part of the solution and how can we you know and so let's get out in front of that you know and go to them and say you know what what is it that we need to do to become resilient and how how can you help us pay for doing it they're they're ready to do it and the and the federal government just gave them a lot of money to do it so they're they're looking for partners this doesn't have to cost us a fortune well thank you gordon this has been really sobering and i'm, I'm not going to sleep very well tonight I have some bad images in my head kind of like far side with our resilient tub like floating away or something. <laughs> yes. but um but no, that's really that's a really good point about emergencies and authority you know and chain of command and that gets really complicated that's a good point thank you Thanks, Gordon. We're just past our time. So I just want to wrap up here. And certainly this is good for future conversations. And um, particularly as we get on the design for the Resilience Hub, if we ever find a spot for that. So um, any last quick comments before we sign off? All right. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Wow. We'll really see you next well. time. Thank you.